where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is peace, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is love. I'll share with you once again, I, it was last August, August of last year when I was last year, and um, Pastor John said, would you like to come again? So here we are. Praise the Lord. The Lord is good. Amen. And um, we're here to um, celebrate uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But my question to you this morning is, how does Easter impact your life? How does Easter impact your life? Margaret Sangster Pippen wrote in the 1950s of her father. He was a leader of the Methodist Church back in England, back in those days. Uh, but he began to notice some e uneasiness in his throat, and he began to drag his leg. He went to the doctor, and the doctor said he had, had an incurable disease. And he had a progressive muscular atrophy. His muscles were wasting away. Now this was a man who was preaching to some 3,000 people in the Westminster Hall in London every Sunday. People would queue for an hour to come and listen to him preach. But now he was not only, his legs were not only wasting away, he could no longer walk, but he could no longer talk. He threw himself into his work. He became leader of the home West, Wesleyan Methodist Home Mission. Figuring he could still write, although his hand would shake, he, he put his hand to writing, and he wrote a number of books and tracts. He pleaded with the Lord, let me stay in the struggle, Lord. I don't mind if I, I can no longer be a general. Give me a regiment to lead. Gradually, Sangster's legs became useless. His voice went completely. But he could still hold that pen. And on Easter morning in 1959, just a few weeks before he died, he wrote a letter to his daughter. And in it he said, It is terrible to wake up on Easter morning, to have no voice, to shout, He is risen. But it would be still more terrible to have a voice and not want to shout. This morning, folks, we can shout. He is risen. Amen. He is risen. We serve a risen Savior. We save, serve a wonderful God. A God who sent his son to die for us. He that was God himself became flesh and died for us. We have many reasons this morning to shout, He is risen. And the reason that you can shout this morning that Jesus is risen, because 2,000 years ago, Witnesses firsthand saw the risen Christ. And it's just as real as it was for them, for us today. And what many who have never experienced the saving grace of Jesus Christ do not realize is the fact that the res resurrection of Jesus Christ can affect your life today, change your life today and change your life for all eternity. We're going to read from the book of Matthew, chapter 28, if you've got your Bibles. Uh, I think we can put it up on the screen there. Thank you, Richard. Now late on the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, we're reading verses 1 through 10. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave, and behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended 
from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his garment white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come see the place where he was lying, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. They came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there, there they shall see me. There are three specific things about the Resurrection Day experience that should make us want to shout and ask the question, why does Easter impact our lives? How does Easter impact our lives? How does the resurrection impact our lives? Well, number one, I can count on God's promises. You can count on God's promises. Jesus had promised his disciples and others that he would rise from the dead. And on that first resurrection morning, that promise was fulfilled. We should have John chapter 2, verses 1 through, I think we have. Yeah, you've got it there. Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews therefore said, It took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So Jesus promised his disciples when he confronted the Pharisees that if they destroyed his temple, if they destroyed his body, he would raise it up in three days. This is a great verse to show Jehovah's Witnesses. Ask them who raised Jesus from the dead, and they will say Jehovah raised him. And Jesus said, I will raise my body. So God raised him, the Holy Spirit raised him, and, and he raised himself. Why? Because he's God, amen? He's God in the flesh. Jesus' promise was remembered by his disciples. And not only was it remembered, it was a force that empowered them and reinforced their faith. He should do the same for us today. Because if Jesus' promise about raising his own body is true, then we can believe all of his other promises. Remember Thomas? He did not believe until he saw Jesus in the flesh. Greater is he who has not seen and believed, Jesus said. We haven't seen, but we believe. We believe, amen? We believe. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For as many as be the promises of God in him, they are yes. Wherefore also him is our amen to the glory of God through us. What were those promises? In him we have forgiveness of sin. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. That's the promise, folks. Do you believe that promise? Glory to God. Jesus is our constant companion. He said, go and make disciples and I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus is always with us. The Holy Spirit is always with us in every situation. 
We have security in knowing that God will never forsake us. And in him we have eternal life. John 6, 47 says, He who believes, Jesus says, has, not will have, not can have, but has eternal life. And if you are here this morning and you uh, believed in Jesus Christ, as BJ says, you've been born again, now you're sitting with him, positionally, in the heavenlies. I just look forward to that day, that resurrection day. He was the first fruits. We are part of that first fruit. We are part of that first resurrection. And if I'm to depart this life before the rapture takes place, I'm going to come back to receive my body, my new body, and believe I need it. I, I went to bed last night, I was so, in so much pain with my knee and my hip. I said to my wife, I've got to get up and take some medication. And then I took the medication and I'm so dry this morning because the medication made me dry. But, um, you know, it'd be great to get up in the morning and not have any aches and pains. And when I get that new body, Pastor Duncan looking forward to his too, amen brother? And, uh, but if it comes in the twinkling of an eye, I'm looking forward to that too. When we'll be caught up to be with him and live with him eternally. That's the blessed hope, folks. The blessed hope. We will live eternally with him. Now, if Jesus had not been raised from the dead, none of these promises would have any meaning. We would not have heard of him, except through probably some obscure history book. The New Testament would not exist. This world as we have it today, and it's not pretty good, but the Holy Spirit wouldn't be here restraining the evil one. We would not be living in the year Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, 2018. You know, I was witnessing to a, a nurse at work a few years ago and she said, okay, I've got a question for you. It was Easter time. She said, I've asked my priest and he doesn't have an answer. I said, okay, hit me with it. She said, why did Jesus cry out on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I said, have you ever read Psalm 22? She said, no. I said, well, go home tonight and read it and come back and see me tomorrow. I said, because that speaks about the suffering Savior. Jesus, when he cried out on the cross, he was quoting King David. And those who heard it knew that that prophecy had come true. That promise that God gave that he would send a Savior had come true. But since he did rise from the dead, we can re rejoice in the fact that he has validated all of the promises that he's made. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ is proof that we today can trust in God. That's how it impacts our life. We can trust in God because God always keeps his promises. Secondly, we can enjoy life to its fullest. Not many Christians today have been led to believe that Christianity can be joyful. You know, when, when the angel appeared to the, uh, to the uh, shepherds, he said, they said, great joy has come. Great joy as the Saviour of the world comes into the world. Some believe that Christianity is so boring and so dull, dull that we, we don't have any joy. You know, we may not be happy all of the time. Things may not always go our way. Not as some prosperity gospelers would have us believe. 
But we can have joy. We can have joy in knowing that Jesus is our Savior. We can have joy because the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. But we have the joy. Glory to God. If you have no joy in your faith in Jesus Christ, then I suggest you go back to the drawing board and start again. You see, we have joy because once you come to Christ and surrender to him and receive your forgiveness of sins, you have no more guilt. You no longer have to live under guilt. Isn't that great? It's as though all of your sins have been gone. have gone into the sea of forgetfulness. There's no more penalty for sin. There is no condemnation for those now in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? If you don't, then the devil is telling you the lie. And we have an eternal destiny. An eternal destiny. Glory to God. And I am, as I said, as I said before, I'm looking forward to that. So we have a freedom, a freedom that gives us real joy, something that a non-Christian cannot have. Listen to the words of Charles Wesley. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. I first surrendered my life to Christ on the 19th of September, 1976. Around about 9.50 a.m. My chains fell off. At that moment, my chains fell off. My heart was free. I was a new person in Christ, a new creation. It was like moving from one dimension to another. And since that day, I've acknowledged that I'm a child of God. You see, in Romans 8:16, we're told that the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are a child of God. What an experience to have. I've got the freedom to live a life of joy because of my faith in a resurrected Lord. Now, when the ladies, uh, these three women, went up to, the, to see Jesus and take him out of the tomb, they were afraid because they've been spoken to by an angel. The appearance of this glorious messenger of God initially struck them with fear. But at the same time, they had an experience of joy. It was joy unimaginable when they knew that the one that they had loved, the one that whom they have worshipped, the one who had been crucified, he was alive again. Death could not hold him down. He was risen. You see, death came into the world as a result of sin. Jesus was sinless. Death had no claim over him. He could not hold him. And you see, we have the righteousness of Christ. Death has no hold over us either. There are ten instances of people being raised from the dead in the Bible. One is in 1 Kings, where Elijah raises the son of the widow of Zarephath. Second is in 2 Kings, where Elisha raises the Shunammite's woman's son. 
Number three is in 2 Kings when the dead Israelite is thrown into the grave of Elisha. And as soon as he hits the bones of Elisha, he's raised again. Glory to God. Of course, Jesus raising the widow of Nain's son, raising Jairus' daughter. He raised his friend Lazarus on the fourth day. The Jews believed that the spirit only hovered for three days. If he raised him before that, it wouldn't have been a miracle. But the fourth day, decay had set in. He raised him on the fourth day. All of the saints that were risen in Matthew 28, verses 50 to 54. Tabitha was raised at the appeal of Peter in Acts chapter 9, and Eutychus was raised by Paul in Acts chapter 20. But Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world, when he rose, he rose never to die again. All of the others died again. That's what makes the resurrection so different to the rest. How does Easter impact your life? I have joy in knowing that Jesus Christ is my Savior. I have joy to know that one day, even though this body should perish, that it will be raised again to live forevermore. You see, part of the enjoyment of life is to know that the resurrected Lord is the same creator of the universe. He came to this planet that we might have life and have life abundantly. You know, that's beyond my comprehension. That God himself should come and die for me. Other religions do not believe that. Many of the cults do not believe that. They say it was a subordinate God, a created God. Charles Wesley wrote these words. Let earth and heaven combine, angels and men agree, to praise in songs divine the incarnate deity. Our God, contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man. Our God became flesh. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but Jesus came to give life abundantly. Not many people can, well, we, none of us can comprehend how God became flesh. But you see, John explained it to us in John 1, 1, and I'm sure you're all familiar with that verse. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God and all things came into being through him and nothing that has come into being has come into being apart from him. In him was life. Original life was in him and he is the light of mankind. I often wonder why John called him the Word, the Logos, NRK and a Logos. In the beginning was the Word. Some say, well, the Word is a communicator, the middle person. But John was writing against the heresies of his day, particularly the Gnostics, the Serentian heresy. In about 580 BC lived a man called Heraclitus. Heraclitus was a philosopher. He was looking for the meaning to life, the rationale, the reason behind everything. He thought he could find it in nature. And he said, when I find this meaning to life, this rationale, this logic to everything, I will know the ex why we exist. And he called it the Logos. And then along came the Stoics, and they too were looking for the for the Logos. They were looking for meaning in nature. Nature is cyclic, you know, things come, they die, they live again. So we'll find it in nature. Then the man came, Philo came along, a Jewish philosopher, and he said, well, I think the Logos is somewhere between God and nature. But he never found it. Then along came John. He said, we've found the Logos. We've touched him. We've beheld him. 
He is the meaning behind all life. He is the reason why we are here. You know that logos word is in biology, biologos, archaeology, archaea, you know, sociology, psychology, all looking for meaning. But you see, when we've got Jesus, we have the meaning, we have the reason, because he created all things, and life came through him. Amen? Glory to God. Glory to God. The third thing we, we learn is we can know our ultimate purpose. I think the Lord likes the number 19 because it was two years earlier than when I accepted the Lord. It was the 19th of August, 1973, and that left an indelible mark on my life. I was an atheist. I was an unbeliever. I was walking around the town one morning, and back in those days, no shops opened on Sunday. The only place that were open was the pub and the church. So you either went to one or the other. And I was out of town, and I was walking the streets doing what we called window shopping. And up the road, I saw this big church, and I later, later learned it was a Methodist church, and uh, there was a bus came and then another bus came and people were getting off and going up these steps and going into the church and I thought well maybe I can go to church but I'll wait till everybody else has gone in and then I changed my mind then I changed my mind again I said God if you are real you go in there with me so it was 20 to 11 Service started at 10.30. I walked up those steps. I was greeted by uh, the steward and he, he gave me a hymn book. I thought, I'll sit at the back of the church and then I can rush out afterwards. So I sat in the, sat in the next back pew. So there was just one empty pew behind me and I sat down and the steward came in and sat behind me. And it was during the reciting of the Lord's Prayer that his hand came on my shoulder my right shoulder. I thought, what on earth does he think he's doing? So I turned around and he's praying like this. I said, Lord, what do you want of me? At the hand squeeze me. I began to cry. I cried for two hours. Just walked the streets for two hours. How am I going to explain this to anybody? I didn't tell anyone. Until the day I was about to leave for Australia. And it had bugged me all that time. And I left Australia on the 27th, 27th of August. Sir. It was a year later, in 1974. And I thought, I've got to tell my brother. I'll never see him again, but I've got to tell somebody about this experience. And. Uh, I told my brother, but just went over the top of his head. But you see, God, when he has a purpose for your life, and you are willing to say, Lord, I'm ready. But I wasn't saved. I didn't get saved until 19th of September, two years later. And within Four months I was in Bible college of getting saved. I had to go find a church because I wasn't saved in the church. And I said to the people, I want to go to Bible college. No, 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 don't go to Bible college, you lose your faith. We've seen it happen so many times. But I went to Bible college and uh, three years later I met my wife. And uh, witness to her, and she came to the Lord. But you see, God has a purpose for your life. Who shall I send? Lord, send me. Send me. And my life's not been on track, you know, when they send a missile from NASA. 
they, you know, they have to tweak it sometimes and keep it back on track. And, and God's like that with our lives. We sometimes go off track and then he has to put us back on track again. Anybody experience that? But we get back on track. In 2008, I was told that I had cancer. I was told to get my affairs into order. Fine. I know where I'm going. But I said to the Lord, I was on the Peter McCallum Hospital, I was eventually, and I said to the Lord, if you heal me, I'll preach the gospel until the day I die. I was just a bit of an itinerant preacher back then. And uh, the whole room was filled with power. I was overcome by the presence of God in that room. I had a theater room. It was the darkest room in the house. And I used to go in there and pray. And I was healed. God healed me. Since then, I finished a master's degree in theology. Started the church, which I didn't want to do. I never imagined I'd be a pastor. I just wanted to be trained up, but you know, just go around churches and preach. But as I look back through my life, I see that God was there every step and he wanted to fulfill his purpose in my life. And God wants to fulfill a purpose in each of your lives too. You see, you'll never know God's ultimate purpose and plan for your life if you don't stop and ask him, what do you want of me? And be ready. Submit to him. Take up your cross daily and follow him. When John Wesley first attended Oxford University, he thought that he would be a parish priest like his father Samuel. He didn't realize that the world would become his parish. Philippians 1 6 Paul says being confident of this that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ he's begun to work in you folks let him bring it to completion W.E. Sangster said it's terrible to wake up on Easter morning and have no voice to shout, he is risen. But it would still be more terrible to have a voice and not want to shout. Today, we have reason to shout. Why? Because you can count on God's promises. Two, you can enjoy life to its fullest. And three, you can know your ultimate purpose. The ultimate impact Isa can have on your life and my life is that one day in eternity we will stand together in the presence of God. When that moment comes in the twinkling of an eye, we will experience our own resurrection because of our relationship with Christ. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, the Apostle Paul said. Jesus is alive today. And just as he rolled away the, the stone that was uh, in front of that tomb, he can roll away whatever immovable obstacle you may be facing in your life. God says the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. As believers, we need to walk daily in the power of his resurrection. We need to be counting on the promises of God in our own lives. We need to have joy. Joy in the faith that we have. That transforms us from fear into courage, addiction into freedom, and anxiety into joy. Are you aware of God's purpose for your life this morning? He can fill the voids in your life and fill you with his purpose. 
this Easter, I pray your lives will be impacted and you will discover what the resurrection of Jesus can accomplish in each of your lives. To the glory of God. Amen. We have one last song.